Well, good singing this morning. That's a great song. I've always enjoyed that. And of course, our time in Revelation kind of makes that come to even a greater depth of richness and magnitude as we've come to understand the significance of what the Lord Jesus Christ is doing and his, his return and our hope in that and our rest in that as well. Well, this morning we're going to t- continue to work through Third John. So if you have your Bibles, and I trust that you do, turn with me to Third John. Typically, I'm in the car singing that song at the loudest volume I can. That's what you heard, yeah. Those weren't sirens, that was my voice. So that was... Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Lord, we love you. Thank you for this occasion to be gathered as you're redeemed. We thank you, Lord, for all the blessings that you have bestowed upon this congregation. Thank you, Lord, for the Uh, This past week of Vacation Bible School, we pray, Lord, that you would work in the hearts of the kids that were there and heard the word, that you would draw them to yourself and that you would save them. We just pray, Lord, that you would use that occasion for that purpose. And thank you, Lord, for all the fine folks who work so hard to make it a a good week in Christ honoring. We we thank you, Lord, for uh, our new member, Roberta. Thank you, Lord, for bringing her here to us and your good providence. You are adding to our body, and we are so grateful. That is a gift and a blessing from you. Your hand is in that. That only happens because of you. We rejoice, Lord, in uh, the fact that we can come today um, without any type of hindrance or threats. We are grateful for the freedoms that we have as a nation. Thank you, Lord, for blessing us in that way. We Pray for all those around the world who are not able to do that, who would love so very, very much to be a part of something like this. And may we be even more grateful knowing um, that we have something that so many others would want to be able to be a part of. We look forward to that day, that great day that we've been studying about in the book of Revelation when the church, the church redeemed and triumphant, will lift its voices in unison to you. And there will be no more fear, no more harm, no more persecution, just dwelling in your resplendent glory. We look forward to that day. We pray, Lord, that you would bless us with the presence of your Holy Spirit. Help us to understand the passages before us. Thank you, Lord, for the message of Third John and for keeping it for us here for all these years. We praise you. In Christ's name, amen. Well, this becomes a familiar passage to us as we read through it, and I trust that uh, our time in it has been a blessing to you um, in regards to your growth in the word and your um, appreciation for the truth, um, because this is certainly what the focus of this short little epistle is, shortest book in the Bible, um, fewest words um, in an epistle, and so, um, but it packs a powerful punch, and it's one to be given great attention and analysis. So that's what we've been doing. And we've taken a bit of a diversion to use this as a platform to deal with the issue of the truth, to understand what John is talking about with regard to the truth, Um, the truth meaning the gospel and the content of God's word and our understanding of it, which points us to Jesus Christ um, and our desperate need for him and the message of the gospel, uh, which is certainly what John is concerned about here. We understand that the church is the repository of the truth And we have two characters in this epistle. We have others, but there are two primary characters. We have Gaius and we have Diotrephes. And it's really a study in contrast as it relates to the proper conduct of a believer relative to their involvement with church and the truth and the improper conduct of one who was standing in opposition to what the purpose of the church was for. And so we'll develop that more more today as we move into verses 5 through 8. Um, a significant passage, one that you may look at at first glance and think, well, there's, there's not a lot there for the pastor to really talk about. Well, I'll surprise you in a moment. <laughs> Beginning with verse 1, the elders of the beloved Gaius, whom I love in truth, beloved, I pray that in all respects you may prosper and be in good health just as your soul prospers. Now, we did talk about that last Sunday. This verse has been taken out of context. It's been used as the platform for the prosperity gospel movement. And of course, we understand it has nothing to do with that. Um, Really, John is drawing a contrast between 
um, Gaius using his means and his abilities for the propagation of the gospel, and he hopes that his physical prosperity, his temporal uh, prosperity, if you will, will be equal to his spiritual prosperity, which is significant, um, uh, which speaks to the uh, character of Gaius and his uh, pursuit of godliness, if you will, in that regard, and his sanctification, his growth, and his care for the word. Verse 3, for I was very glad when brethren came and testified to your truth, that is, how you are walking in truth. I have no greater joy than this to hear of my children walking in the truth. Beloved, you are acting faithfully in whatever you accomplish for the brethren, and especially when they are strangers, and they have testified to your love before the church. You will do well to send them on their way in a manner worthy of God. For they went out for the sake of the name, accepting nothing from the Gentiles. Therefore, we ought to support such men so that we may be fellow workers with the truth. I wrote something to the church, but Diotrephes, who loves to be first among them, does not accept what we say. For this reason, if I come, I will call attention to his deeds, which he does, unjustly accusing us with wicked words. And not satisfied with this, he himself does not receive the brethren either, and he forbids those who desire to do so and puts them out of the church." Beloved, I do not imitate what is evil. Beloved, do not imitate what is evil, but what is good. The one who does good is of God. The one who does evil has not seen God. Demetrius has received a good testimony from everyone and from the truth itself. And we add our testimony, and you know that our testimony is true. I have many things to write to you, but I am not willing to write them to you with pen and ink. But I hope to see you shortly, and we'll speak, and we will speak face to face. Peace be to you. The friends greet you. Greet the friends by name. So, we understand from our study of this book so far that um, Gaius is a believer, apparently a man of means, and he has been engaged in um, helping John deliver his letters to the churches. He has been engaged in assisting and aiding others um, and in this instance, we would understand that it's Demetrius, who is ultimately a, a courier, if you will, along with some others who have been taking the time to take John's letters and deliver them to the churches in the greater Ephesus area, and perhaps even beyond um, that realm. And so for, this, for us to understand the meaning of the, of the passage, we need to appreciate the significance of what Gaius is engaged in and what he is up against. He has a person who is opposed to this and is actively attempting to thwart the efforts that he's engaged in to deliver the word of God to the churches. That's significant. And we've talked about that, and we've talked about the impact that that would have on a church, the church not receiving. These letters are being written by an apostle, messenger of God, the ones who God gave us at the beginning of the church age to write these things down under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit to build us up in the faith, to help us to better understand who is Jesus Christ and why we need him and what our relationship with him looks like, and importantly, what is the purpose of the church. And so Gaius has worked in a very significant way, um, as John commends him here, with regard to that endeavor. And so what we find today, though, in verses 5 through 8 is, is this passage or these passages rel related to the issue of Christian hospitality. The idea that Gaius would be engaged in this demonstrates that he is being hospitable, and we want to talk about what this hospitality ultimately looks like. And I'm going to tell you that it doesn't look like what you think it is. Um, and there's a historical context to this that's important, and something that we'll, we'll draw out as we work through this particular passage. And we're going to find here that we have a, a theology and application, something that is it, that's consistent with what we read in verse 4. Now, in verse 4, John commends and, and speaks to the joy that he receives when he learns that believers are living in the truth. He says in verse 4, I have no greater joy than this, to hear of my children walking in the truth. Now, we understood from verse 4 that when John uses that phrase, walking in the truth, he's talking about that habitual living within the sphere of truth, that a Christian's life is ordered and directed by the Word of God. Now, that doesn't mean that it tells me how to build a birdhouse or lay a foundation for a building, 
but it does tell me how to live in a manner that is pleasing to the Lord and consistent with one who has been saved, one who knows the Lord Jesus Christ. So we understand then that there are certain characteristics that can be attributed to a believer that ought to be evident in a Christian's life. And for Gaius, one of the evidences that he would give and which John would focus on was his hospitality. And when we talk about hospitality here, we mean that what what Gaius was doing, he was using his means, his money, his home, his resources, his time to help deliver the word of God. He wanted these letters that John was writing to get to the churches. So what was significant at this point in time, too, is that when people traveled, they didn't have a Holiday Inn to stay in. They weren't able to stop at, you know, uh, a restaurant along the way. Um, No Longhorn Steakhouses, no uh, Dairy Queens, no gas stations for bathrooms or crackers and pop or whatever else you might need, uh, you know, uh, that way. We all know what we do when we go to gas stations. We buy gas and we buy a lot of other junk um, to, to eat. No Twizzlers, no Diet Cokes, you know, all those things. They didn't have that. So they relied on people, in particular Christians, because Christians were ostracized by the society. They were not liked. And there was no effort on anyone's part to accommodate them. And to accommodate them might bring persecution or some form of retaliation by the community in which you lived. And so it was common for people at this point in time, in particular Christians, to rely upon other Christians to give them accommodation as they traveled delivering these letters. Now, oftentimes, what would happen, if you can only imagine, you're sitting in your living room on a Tuesday night, and around 9.30, someone knocks on the door. And you open it up, and they say, hi, I'm Demetrius, I've got a bunch of letters from the Apostle John to get to the churches, but I need a place to rest. And you as a believer would welcome them into your home and accommodate them that way. And you would give them a safe place to stay, you would welcome them in, and oftentimes these people would stay for lengthy periods of time as they worked within that area and as they delivered the letters and were engaged in the ministry that would have been attendant with that type of endeavor. They were in essence missionaries if you will. And the idea here is that in all likelihood they had been even taught by John to some degree, that John had helped them better understand the letters that he had written, that they were going into the churches to help train pastors and others within the church to receive what John had written and to have it explained to them. So they were, they were kind of um, itinerant preachers, circuit riding preachers, if you will, and they needed places to stay. And so they were strangers oftentimes to people. And they would welcome these strangers into their home and give them food and shelter and clothing and things that they would need in order to be able to successfully do that. And so this is what John is referencing here and what he is speaking to when we begin to read these verses in verse 5. Gaius was engaged in that endeavor. And the significant aspect of it, it was done in a sacrificial way. And again, I want you to dispel in your mind right now the idea of hospitality being merely entertainment. It wasn't. In this time frame and in this type of setting, these people were actually brought in and fully embraced. They wanted for nothing. They were taken care of. And so John, as he looks at Gaius, is saying that one of the means by which Gaius is living out the reality of his conversion is this sacrificial level of hospitality gospel hospitality, if you will. It was a hospitality designed to facilitate the deliverance of the word of God and the message of the gospel to the churches and ultimately the people in those churches and the people within the communities in which those churches were ministering. So it's significant. It's a big deal. So I don't want you to think about mere entertainment. Um, we, We just simply do not have a grasp. I spent a lot of time delving into and diving into the meaning of the word hospitality and the historical context of it and the cultural context of it, and it's significant. And we really can't fully comprehend the meaning of Third John without appreciating the level of sacrifice that was called upon in order to facilitate this. Again, bearing in mind that they often didn't know these people, and two, that within the community, when this was seen, 
it would have been a black mark against that person because that was not something that was, that was looked upon in a kind way. And so when someone would have seen Gaius bringing these Christian missionaries, Demetrius and other people, into his home and facilitating this, there would have been talk. There would have been concern. What's he doing? Is he bringing these Christians into our town? What's going to happen? They didn't like that. Bearing in mind, too, that the persecution of Christians at this point in time in history, um, in, the, in the late A.D., 80s, eight, early A.D., 90s, was significant. And it was primarily coming from other worshipers of other gods, temple worshipers, temple workers. They didn't like it when Christians showed up in town because it was bad for business. It hurt them. And this would have been a harm to Gaius as well because as a businessman within that community, he would have suffered repercussions as well for hosting and being hospitable to these emissaries of John, these deliverers of the word of God. So that's a big, big deal. So it's not just merely having them in, buying them a pizza, giving them a Diet Coke, and sending them on their way, having them over for dinner. This was a, this was a life, in a sense, a life commitment. And so for us, as we make modern-day application of this, it speaks to our commitments to others who are engaged in gospel ministry, those who have given themselves over to the proclamation, preaching, and deliverance of the Word of God. And what it should do for us, it should speak to our hearts with regard to the measure of sacrifice that we are making in, effort to, in, in, in an effort to, to do what Gaius was doing to be the people who are making certain that those who do not have the Word of God or who have small, who have uh, infrequent opportunity to be involved in church and to hear about Jesus Christ, that we're helping those who are trying to engage with those people, like Evan. I was talking with Evan this past week about his ministry in Thailand and what he's doing here, and he shared with me some shocking things and just the unique challenges and the very small number of people that he's trying to reach the people within this village that he's working and the language that he's trying to use to develop a Bible for them, this is a small number of people, maybe 1,500 to 2,500 people total within this dialect. And, and so he's working with them, but there's opposition, and there's even the context in which there's a spiritual opposition that's very significant um, that I found to be very intriguing. And so you and I, while we cannot just simply bring them into our home, what we can do and ought to do, and the exhortation that we take away from this in application, is that we then make sacrificial efforts on our part to help. Whether it be in the context of the local church, whether it be in the context of that local church's support of its missionaries. That's what this speaks to. So hospitality goes to the idea of Christians engaging in a sacrificial surrendering of resources to help others who are engaged in gospel ministry, in particular within the church and the church's endeavor, because the church, and again, this is an issue that we have to be careful about. The primary obligation, the primary uh, oversight of this has been given to the church not parachurch organizations. This belongs to the church. And Gaius' efforts were to get information into the churches, not to surrender it to a third party, but to do so under the auspices of the authority of the pastorate and eldership within a church and to make certain that what was taking place was proper and correct and being delivered and understood. And so for John... What Gaius is doing, and this is why he's making such a big deal about what Gaius is doing. Gaius is engaged in a meaningful, significant, sacrificial way. He is living his life within that habitual sphere of the truth by doing this. By making the effort to accommodate these individuals who are delivering his letters to the churches. And again, bearing in mind the significance of that. These men had been taught by John. They had been instructed we understand that in all likelihood that what's being delivered based upon the study of this time frame and the church and church history is at a minimum the gospel of John and likely his first epistle. So that's, that's a big deal. 
especially in the context of what's going on at that point in time, the growth of Gnosticism and the persecution of the Christians. We understand that Timothy um, would ultimately give his life in the context of standing for the truth by the worshipers of the goddess Diane. They drug him through the streets until he was dead. And so this is, so when we look at this, don't remove it from the context. And so when we look at it too, we have to ask ourselves, how are we engaged in this same level of sacrifice? The Bible tells us that the Lord loves a cheerful giver, and I have some things that I'm going to share with you that, that, that Sinclair Ferguson wrote down about the church and, and the church's attitude about giving and, and the, the role of the church in that regard as we work our way through this uh, uh, passage. So let's look at verse 5. We're going to spend some time here over the next couple of Sundays looking at this, but number verse 5, beloved, there's that affirmation, that derivative of agape that John ascribes to Gaius. Only Christians can love each other in this manner. We can only agape each other as believers. The world cannot do that. So the love that we have for each other is a spirit-driven type of love. As we read this morning in Philippians, it's an indicator of our place in Christ. It's something that ought to be evident in our life as the redeemed of Christ. It ought to mark us. It ought to distinguish us, as should joy as well. And so John, again, is ascribing to Gaius that unique Christian love. And again, doing so, in our minds, should affirm for us the idea that what Gaius is doing is really a proper thing, and that, that John loves him in the context of demonstrating the reality of his conversion. He sees him truly as a brother in Christ. Look what he says. Beloved, you are acting faithfully in whatever you accomplish for the brethren, and especially when they are strangers. Well, this is unique. This is really quite uh, a powerful little verse here, and, and one that you may read and kind of gloss and not think it's significant, but it is significant. So he says to Gaius, Gaius, you are acting, you are engaged in a faithful deed, if you will. What you're doing indicates that you truly are a believer. It's an act predicated upon a belief. So when he says to Gaius, you are acting faithfully, that's significant in whatever. And, what he, and that word whatever is significant too. These, these words are just packed with so much meaning. Truly, you can see the Holy Spirit's hand in the way that John is using these words. So beloved, referring to Gaius, the affinity and the faith is there. We too love each other that way. Gaius, you are acting, you are engaged in faithful deeds in whatever, speaking to Gaius's past, present, and future behavior, his conduct in the faith. And so these things that he's been doing, his accommodating these strangers, his helping them with the deliverance of the word of God, him bringing them into his home to allow them to facilitate and engage in this process of deliverance and, and training, is significant, and it's a demonstration of the genuineness of his faith. So again, speaking to this in the context of a modern application, the words that we would use to ourselves this way would be simply this, Community Bible Church, you are indeed engaged in a faithful deed when you are accomplishing this for the Christians, for other Christians, when you are helping others deliver the word of God, when you are supportive of gospel ministry, when you are engaged within your local body, both with time and resources, that you are committed to that and that you are engaged in that endeavor. That is a faithful demonstration of your salvation, of your regeneration. Now, I, I don't want this to be lost on you, so the idea of Christian hospitality isn't that you just simply have people over to your home, which I think is incredibly important and ought to be done and something that you do. That's the one another's. That's that sharing with each other and engaging with each other in that way. But this speaks to something that's a greater dynamic. This speaks to the idea of you being committed to the priority of the church, the purpose of the church, your understanding that the church is the repository of the Word of God. That's a big deal to you because the Word of God is how you came to know Jesus Christ. Faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the Word. 
and you know that to be true. And so a faithful demonstration of that reality for you is to be committed to the local church in its engagement of the proclamation of the gospel by supporting the church with your time and resources. No, I'm not begging for money. You know me better than that. But in the context of where God has placed us at this point in time, in this passage, I think it's important for us to understand that. What happened in VBS this past week is a demonstration of this. It truly is. To give sacrificially, to give abundantly, to give beyond your means, to break piggy banks, to decide not to buy the PlayStation and use the money for the missionary, that is what we're speaking to here. It is that level of commitment. It is that level of sacrifice. And I think this has been lost on the church. We have relegated these things to other people, to other organizations. Oh, they'll take care of it. I'm just going to put the money in the plate and I don't care. No, you ought to care. You need to care. Because what is going on is that you're thinking in your mind as you're, as you're giving and as you're cooperating in that endeavor, you're saying to yourself, I want to be a part of Delivering the word of God that saved me too. That opened my eyes to my need for a savior. I want other people to know about that. This is why John is so attached to Gaius. Because he sees what Gaius is doing. And it's a big deal. And it would have been a huge deal then. And so as I look at verse 5, we understand then that the, 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 the communication from John is to be... Um, significant for us in that we see that a Christian ought to be engaged in these faithful deeds, that we too ought to be acting faithfully in whenever and wherever and whatever we are accomplishing for the brethren, other Christians. There are other Christians in Thailand, in Burma, wherever they're at. There are Christians who need us. The churches in the greater Ephesus area were fledgling churches, baby churches, young believers who needed to hear the word of God. John, by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, is writing these things and he's sending them out and he's sending these men out into these churches to teach these young pastors and elders and deacons and families in the church to understand who Jesus Christ is. And Gaius is all in. He's saying, I'm going to be a part of that. And I don't care if I lose my business. I don't care what people say. I don't care if the government doesn't like it. I don't care if my neighbor is upset. I don't care if the Diane worshipers are going to be angry with me. Yeah, they may drag me to death too. But I'm going to do it because I love the Lord Jesus Christ. And I love those who are engaged in that endeavor. That's what's going on here. That's the significance of it. And so when you come here, and you participate, and as Noah noted this morning, giving is an act of worship. You're then engaging in that endeavor, but you're also doing it in a way that says, I'm all in. I want to be a part of this. I'm going to do as Gaius did. I'm going to live my life within the habitual sphere of the truth, and I too, like Gaius, I'm going to engage in this Christian hospitality in a way that makes a difference. As I noticed, Sinclair Ferguson wrote in his book, Devoted to God's Church, something that's significant with regard to this issue. Um, it's in the chapter entitled The Glorious Addiction, which I really like the title of that chapter. And he's talking about some things that are significant for the redeemed, the ministry of the word, of course, which we've talked about, the fellowship of the saints which is significant, the coming together as the redeemed of Christ, to rejoice together, be committed together. But he also talks about that in the context of the fellowship being the means by which um, we fulfill what Gaius is doing, that we are engaged in the, 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 the true fellowship of the church and the gospel ministry endeavor that's, uh, that the church is committed to. Sinclair writes as follows that a couple of uh, sociology professors back in 2008, in collaboration with some other people, did a financial study of the stewardship of churches of North America. 
And as it's entitled, this article is entitled, Passing the Plate. And these two individuals who did the study are not TV hucksters, he notes, begging, bargaining, or bickering for money. Their book is not a popular tract urging Christians to give more, but a serious academic study based on the gathering and analysis of data by careful research. They subtitled the introduction to this article, The Riddle of Stingy Giving. They say that despite a reputation for generosity, American Christians give away relatively little money to religious and other purposes. A sizable number of Christians give little sums of money. Only a small percent of American Christians give generously in proportion to what their churches call them to give. Most American Christians are remarkably ungenerous. He goes on to write, they go on to note that 20% of professing Christians do not give. They calculate that if only those Christians who are genuinely regular church attenders a few times a month or more frequently were to give 10% of their after-tax income, the result would be that there would be $46 billion additional available to fund ministries of all kinds. The authors provide several detailed pages of potential ministries that could be funded handsomely, even lavishly, by such giving. Ferguson goes on to write, No amount of lecturing, hectoring, pleading, browbeating, or begging will accomplish this, or at least not for long. Our habits are too ingrained, and our addiction to money runs too deep. Only a new and more powerful addiction can transform that. This is precisely what addiction to the church does. Someone has well said that the devil teaches us to say about our wealth, it is mine and I am hoarding it. The world at its best teaches us to say it is mine, but I am willing to share some of it. Only the gospel teaches us to say about our wealth, it belongs to Jesus, and for him I will use it. So, and that comes in the context of what Ferguson refers to as this gospel addiction and the church. So he's speaking in this chapter to the idea of church membership and what it means to be a member of a church and what that looks like. And so too, what John is doing here for us with Gaius is demonstrating what that church member would look like as they live their life within that habitual sphere of the truth. That's significant. That's very significant. This is a clarion call, an indicting call, if you will, to the church based upon the information that Ferguson has provided to us. I'm grateful for a dad. It's Father's Day, but I'm grateful for a dad who always taught me that giving is significant. I watched him give sacrificially. I saw him do that as an example and as a model. And I hope, too, that you dads out there will show that and demonstrate that your, to your children as well. But keep in mind what's going on here. You've got to see the point of the hospitality is gospel connected. This is, this is so big of a deal that God did something for us to enable us to do this. Turn with, Rome, turn with me to Romans chapter 12. Now, of course, we're familiar with Romans chapter 12. It comes at that point that is that great concluding application, if you will, to all the 11 chapters that have gone before and the significance of the doctrine that we've learned, justification, um, issues related to propitiation and our deadness and sin and God saving us and his sovereign grace and all of those things are all now brought to a concluding application in verse 12. And that's why he says in verse 1, therefore... I urge you, brethren, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies a living and holy sacrifice acceptable to God, which is your spiritual service of worship. So as I reach back into 3 John and I look at verse 5, what I'm understanding is that the means by which Gaius was demonstrating the reality of Romans 12.1 was his acts of hospitality to these brethren who were delivering the word of God in a sacrificial way willing to risk life and limb and resources in order to make certain that the word of God was being delivered and propagated because he knew that it was the word of life and it is the word of life. And so as I look at this verse in verse 
this chapter 12, verse 1, I'm seeing then that this habitual life is connected to this very thing, noting as well that this is a means of worship. It's connected to worship. The result of this is in verse 2, and do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. So Gaius' mind demonstrates a renewing, a quality that's only Christian. Do you see this? So that you may prove what the will of God is, that which is good and acceptable and perfect. So what is that? Well, let's find out. Verse 3, for through the... For through the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you not to think more highly of himself than he ought to think, but to think so as to have sound judgment, as God has allotted to each a measure of faith. So, of course, what we don't do and what we don't find to be true of Gaius, he's not bragging about himself. John is commending him. And we don't do these things to garner attention from anybody else. Don't let the right hand know what the left hand is doing. You know, we're not going to put your picture up in the hallway you know, our top giver. I've seen churches do that. Top giver this month. Walked into a church one time, they had a placard top giver and had guy's name. There's his reward. There you got it. Can you believe that? Unbelievable. For through the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you, not to think more highly of himself than he ought to think, but to think so as to have sound judgment as God has allotted to each a measure of faith. For just as we have many members in one body and all the members do not have the same function, so we who are many are one body in Christ and individually members one of another. Since we have gifts that differ according to the grace given to us, each of us is to exercise, each of us is to uh, exercise them accordingly. So let's pay attention to something. Since we have gifts. All right, so that's a given. Everyone who's here that's a Christian this morning has one gift, at least one, likely more than that, but at least one. Since we have gifts that differ according to the grace given to us, each of us is to exercise them accordingly, if prophecy according to the proportion of his faith. If service, now look, notice this, if service in his serving, or he who teaches in his teaching, or he who exhorts in his exhortation, he who gives with liberality, he who leads with diligence, he who shows mercy with cheerfulness. Let love be without hypocrisy, abhor what is evil, cling to what is good, be devoted to one another in brotherly love, hearkening back to Paul and Philippians again, give preference to one another in honor, not lagging behind in diligence, fervent in spirit, serving the Lord. So that's the mindset, that's the attitude of a Christian. Notice in verse 12, what we found also to be true in Philippians 2, rejoicing in hope, persevering in tribulation, devoted to prayer, verse 13, contributing to the needs of the saints, practicing hospitality. Now that's significant. So, so in the context of this theological paradigm, this setting, it's significant that what God has done, that when he saves you, There is an automatic expectation that there is going to be a demonstrable gift and that verses 9 through 13 are going to be engaged. They're the DNA of the Christian. That's what's going on. You've been now, your new creation. What do you look like? Your DNA has just been described. This is how you're wired. Your love is without hypocrisy. You're going to abhor what is evil. That goes to being salt. We talked about that in Sunday school this morning. You throw the salt out, it purifies the soil. So abhorring what is evil is being salty. Cling to what is good. Be devoted to one another in brotherly love. This goes back to Philippians 1.27. Conduct yourself only in a manner that is worthy of the gospel. Give preference to one another in honor. Be respectful not lagging behind in diligence, make it heartfelt, engage, don't make it hypocritical, don't make it feel fake, fervent in spirit, I want to do this, is there anything else I can do, what, give me more, throw another log in my arms, I want more, serving the Lord, you're not serving, you're not serving yourself, you're serving the Lord, Rejoicing in hope. What is your hope? Your hope is in the Lord. 
persevering in tribulation. Yeah, people don't like me as a Christian. I'm going to keep on going. Keep on keeping on. We used to have that bumper sticker with that guy with that funky little walk he was doing. <laughs> Devoted to prayer. Of course, that's important. Now, look, contributing to the needs of the saints. That's significant. Spiritual needs, temporal needs, practicing hospitality. And there's that word. So in 3 John, that's exactly... So John is, is making application, if you will and seeing application of Romans 12, in particular Romans, the impact of Romans 12, 1 through 13, in the life of Gaius. That is that habitual living within the sphere of truth. And so for us, back in 3 John, we see then that Gaius is called and commended again to continue this. Beloved, you are acting faithful. You are doing those things that have been described that are attendant with being in the faith. You are engaged in these faithful deeds, these acts, these actions of faith, these faith actions, if you will, for the brethren, for fellow Christians, and especially when they are strangers, which was significant. Now, you and I, that perhaps in the context of application is a little bit more difficult, but it's not common for us to just have people randomly show up at our homes and you place them into your home and bring them in as a family and incorporate them into community and make them feel welcome and all of that. That's what was going on with Gaius and these people. But we find is that it's repeated. It's habitual. This is the pattern of Gaius's life. And the consequence, of course, in verse 6, we'll pick up later on this, and they have testified to your love before the church. You will do well to send them on their way in a manner worthy of God. We'll talk more about that next week, Lord willing. So what we find then is this, that Christian hospitality isn't just simply having somebody over for, for pizza. Nothing's wrong with that. Do not go home and say, the pastor doesn't want me to have people over for pizza. That's not what I'm saying at all. I want you to do that, and do it often, and do it a lot, and that's great, and I'm glad for that, and there's a good, there's, there's a good level of that in our church, and I appreciate that. But what I am wanting you to understand is that this issue of hospitality is a God-given characteristic that he expects to be exercised within the body of Christ. That's important. Remember, we're just stewards. It's not ours. It's his. Whatever you have, God gave it to you. Whether great or small, it's all of God. It's all from God. And so John is setting before us Gaius as an example of one who is engaged in genuine Christian hospitality. It's important for us to understand what that looks like what that looks like. So I hope this has been encouraging to you. I hope it's been eye-opening to you. I know in the context of my own study about the word hospitality and looking at the historical context of it, it was significant to see the magnitude and the meaning of that with regard to the sacrifice, the personal sacrifice that was called for relative to what John is speaking of regarding Gaius. Of course, this is something that the redeemed of Christ do. This is something that we've been equipped to do. We are no longer the natural man who does not understand the things of God. I trust that most of us in this room this morning know the Lord Jesus Christ as our Savior and that we're resting in his finished work. And so that begs the question, are we engaged in the level of hospitality that we are called to by Scripture? God gives grace. He resists the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. We're told in the book of James, chapter 4. So we keep those things in mind, and we live in a manner that demonstrates the reality of our conversion. This is one of the means by which we can do that. Now, we don't faith in that act. We don't look to that act in the context of making us more saved. It's just a demonstration of your salvation. It shows to people you are truly saved. This is what Christians do. This is what Gaius was doing. This is what John is pointing out for us. So I hope you will keep that in mind and, and be encouraged and understand the significance of what Christian hospitality looks like 
um, from the point of Scripture. Let's pray. Lord, we love you. Thank you for this day. Thank you for this encouraging word. Thank you for this convicting word. Help us to understand it in a more biblical way. Help us to see it and comprehend it in a manner that speaks to what Christians are called to do. Help us to be biblically hospitable people. We ask, Lord, that you would continue to open doors and opportunities for us to do that. Thank you for the occasions that we have had. May we continue to pursue those for your glory and for your honor. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.